Hi, this is Tom Johnson at I'd rather be writing.com. This is a recording of a presentation that I gave at the STC Silicon Valley chapter on October 21, 2013. And the presentation's title is Why Users Can't Find Answers in Help. I hope you enjoy it. If you have comments, just list them in the comments field below. Thanks. Yeah. Yay. Uh, so, just out of curiosity, who has like seen my blog or read my blog? I'd rather be writing. dot com. A few. Okay. Cool. Great. So uh, I like to record the presenta my presentations. I know we're also recording with Go Meeting, but uh, um, <clears throat> I've noticed that even well, let's say we have ten people at, at a chapter meeting. I'll record it and post it on my blog, and there'll be like several hundred people who will download it. I don't know if they listen to it all the way through, but at least they download it. So. Imagine like hundreds of people, lots of excitement. <laughs> uh, anyway, so my presentation tonight is called "Why Users Can't Find Answers and Help," and we're gonna have fun tonight. We're gonna, we're gonna I'm gonna tell a story. We're gonna play a game because you can't have a presentation from somebody who works at a gamification company without some kind of techniques, right? You would just feel cheated. So I've got I've got that in the works, and uh, I've got some survey results and stuff. So anyway. Let's get started. So about two or three years ago, I was uh, wrestling with a problem about findability. I was really trying to figure out the way to organize things, and I, and I had this epiphany that if I could just organize content in the right way, put things in the right folders that made sense to the users, they would find the topics, they would connect, and, and I would have solved the problem. And so I set upon this, this, this quest to write a hundred blog posts about findability because I was going to solve this problem. When you have hundreds of topics, how do you connect the user to the exact one they're looking for? And so I, I wrote lots of posts on this and got some visibility. Some uh, a guy in, in England who followed my blog was really interested and he's like, hey, come speak at a conference over here. So I, I put my shoulder to the wheel even more on this topic. And while I was over there, this was a conference in Manchester. I was like, I had this whole presentation on findability and faceted search and navigation and all these different concepts. And during the, during the presentation and after the presentation, I just kind of had this feeling that, that it we didn't really solve the problem. And the problem wasn't so much findability, but the content itself was the problem. Like when I started to look at my own help content where, where I work, where I've worked previously, I think that users probably came to the content and just either A, it didn't answer their questions anywhere in the, in the help, or it was confusing, it wasn't presented in a way that really connected with them, maybe visually or, or with examples and other things. So I decided I was going to um, kind of step back and say, look, if we're going to fix this problem with help, it's not going to be implementing faceted navigation. It's going to be fixing the content. But so many presentations, sessions, conferences all focus on the publishing and the bells and whistles around how you, how you deliver content, the XML, the single sourcing, and, and this discussion that is about how you create content seems to get overlooked. So this light bulb moment kind of came on and I said, look, we, we've really got to focus on the content. And when the content is good, then people will naturally find it, they'll, they'll connect with it, and they'll get the answers that they need. You know, it's, like, it's like a vicious cycle. If, if your stuff doesn't really satisfy people, then it kind of goes down in the, in the search engine res results, and pretty soon nobody ever sees it. Ex exactly, exactly. The, you know, um, this slide right here is really small. You can't really see it. It used to be a bigger slide, but... It's, it says a fictitious timeline about the evolution of help material from the user's perspective. So let's say in 1960, the user says, help sucks. Well, in 1970, maybe the user says, help's okay. And 1980, help's, help's decent. And then 10 years later, you know, help is good and help is great. And why is it after 50 years, we don't see this evolution of the user experience trending towards a positive, you know, uh, embracing experience where, where you meet people and you say, hi, I'm a tech writer, and they should like give you a hug, or they should smile and say, thank you. you know, instead, it's, it's like, oh, you're one of those guys. You're, oh, you're that guy, you know, that guy who creates those terrible manuals that I had to suffer through. 
like the Einstein <laughs> definition, or if it's really Einstein of insanity doing the same thing and expecting a different yeah. result. Yeah, well, we've gotten much more efficient at managing bad content, essentially. Um, all right, so I decided to start with a survey. I listed, you can't read this, don't worry about it. Uh, the next slide is going to make it more visible. I, I outlined 20 reasons why people aren't like finding the answers and help. You know, what is it about the content that's just not connecting with the user? Um, so here are the reasons that they gave. I just put 20, I guess I will read these. Um, I put 20 reasons and the top seven are ones that I'm going to dive into and the bottom 13 I'm not. But we'll start with um, <clears throat> the top one, the help doesn't provide concrete examples that make concepts understandable. Actually, you know what? This next slide actually has this top seven bigger. So why don't I do this? Let me start from the bottom and then we'll go on to the top ones. Okay, the very bottom. The help is written for a user way beyond the level of the actual user. No, hardly anybody thought that was why people can't find what they're looking for in help. Second to bottom. The user wants to read a PDF to prop up beside their monitor, but only HTML is available. That's not really why people can't find their answers and help. Um, the PDF is interesting because if you think about how many cycles people spend trying to single source to PDF and HTML, uh, it, it's kind of mind boggling. If you, if you just take the PDF out of the equation, you, you solve a ton of headaches with publishing. The help is written, oh wait, the help is only available online, but the user wants to use the product offline. Not really a big reason. The help is written in an intimidating formal language that users find off-putting and unfriendly. So right now there's kind of a big movement towards this emotional language in help, you know, using more vernacular, friendly speech, which is totally good, right? But it's not really a main reason why, why users aren't connecting with help topics. Yeah, translation is problematic. Yeah, the translation. Yeah, your folksy stuff isn't going to go with Japanese. Yeah. All right, uh, another one. The help is written by an outside tech writer isolated from the business process and, and environment. The content is out of date or wrong, perhaps referring to a previous version. The user opens the help but is immediately intimidated because it's about 600 pages long. The user is too lazy to search through the help in a, in a thorough enough way to find the answer. The answer is in a text form, but the user likes visuals, so they skip over long text blocks. The table of contents and the help file is too massive to allow users to find anything. The user's question involves a feature not available. The help only lists what you can do. You know, this is one of my favorites. Like, I just had to pause on this one. This, so this had 27% of people agreeing that, yeah, this is kind of why they can't find it. Um, because as a tech writer, maybe you're taught that, hey, we don't want to call attention to the limitations in our product. And yet those are like the exact questions users have is, why can't I do this? <laughs> There's a fellow by the name of Pete Shorer, uh, who I don't know you may have heard of. Uh, every once in a while he sends an email. But he wrote this book called Zero Search Time Documentation. And his theory was... You take all of the things, uh, all of the possible verbs and all of the possible nouns or whatever that uh, pertain to your product, put them all together, and that's how you write an, an index. And if and if hmm. some combination your product doesn't address, then you say, that's not in here. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah. But that kind of seems like it signals back to the days when index was really popular and you know used. Anyway, sounds cool. All right, uh, a couple more here. Users don't trust help material, so they refuse to look through it and turn to Google instead. Right, this is kind of aligning with the whole emotional thing. You want to build trust. It's more like they trust Google. The yeah. Fact that they don't trust the help material. They right. don't know anything about the help <laughs> The user looks in the wrong place in the help. The topic can logically appear in various folders. So these are the reasons that not, not that many people ranked as being basically wrong with help. Now this is, I had 200 people respond to the survey. so. Uh, basically, if you double the numbers here, 104 said these and 100 and so forth. So these are the top seven. This is what I'm going to focus on through the rest of the presentation. We're going to kind of tackle each of these um, bit by bit. The help, let's go with number one. The help doesn't provide concrete examples that make the concepts understandable. The answer is buried in a long page. 
but the user spends just two minutes max scanning the page. The answer isn't in the help because the help only sticks with obvious information. The user searches for the answer, but the help's poor search engine optimization prevents the answer from surfacing. The answer is an isolated task, but the user needs a more connected beginning to end workflow. The help uses terms unfamiliar to the user, gizmo instead of widget. And finally, the help has been fragmented and dispersed over many small topics, so the help is a maze. All right, so here is the game part. <clears throat> Each of these, think of these as levels. Remember we had seven of these, right? Each of these is a level that you have to try to solve in order to win the game, right? So you are going to, you, I've presented you with seven problems and now you're going to <clears throat> come up with seven solutions, not all at once, right? We're going to, we're going to kind of go through this. By the way, I've never tried this in a presentation before, so who knows? Maybe it'll flop. If you don't have a pen, let me know. I have, uh, I have this printed out. So this is what I'm handing you. It's kind of the same slide, but more friendly. <clears throat> All right. Wait, I, I, have, I have tons more. I was really optimistic and printed out 35. Everybody got one? Okay, if you don't have a pen, let me know. Okay. I brought... A few extra pens. So now here's how the here are the rules of the game. Okay, so we're going to talk about level one, and you're going to write before before I <clears throat> kind of give my two cents on what the solution is. Any more pens? No, no, nobody else needs pens. Good, because I only brought five. All right, so. Uh, we're going to talk about level one. I'm just going to kind of explain the problem. You're going to write your solution in the box, right? Now try to write legibly, try to kind of write big, because here's the other parts of the game. You, now, you get 10 points for each solution that you add, like for each level. If you post this paper on Twitter with the hashtag techcom and game, you get 15 points. And if you get the most retweets, you get 15 points. So you could get 100 points total, and then you would win the Solutions Champion Reward. If you only get 85, you get the Industry Influencer Award. And if you get 70 points, you get the Insightful Mind Reward. Sorry, I'm kind of laughing just because all day long I'm like configuring this and that reward, and it never really connects with anything I do outside. So it's kind of fun. They're not actually anything. There may be a badge that I give you online that you can put on your website or something, but you know, there's, there's no like trip to Disneyland involved here. Okay, so any questions? Is this kind of exciting? This is kind of the interactive game part, right? And it's, it's throughout the whole thing. Okay, so number one, information is fragmented. This is, we're going to start at the, the easiest, well, not the easiest, just the the top seven and, and proceed up to the top number one. But I'm going to kind of explain a little bit more about, <clears throat> about this, this problem. All right, and this is why users can't find you know, what they're looking for in help. The help has been fragmented and dispersed over many small topics, so the help is a maze. So if you've ever opened up a help file and you, you've seen maybe short topics and you're like, well, what's the, what's the context of this topic? And you like try to go back and you maybe get a little more context, but it seems as if every, every, as Mark Baker would say, every topic begins on page 297 and there is no page one. It's like there's no, there's no completeness with the articles. There's just a bunch of short little interconnected pieces and you play ping pong as you bounce around in the help file trying to find a more complete answer. This often happens when people maybe have a, a big PDF like with um, lots of pages and they burst it apart at the H2 tags to make it so every H2 tag starts a new page or something. All right, so uh, go ahead and write down what you think is a solution to this information fragmentation kind of problem in a help file. Um, and then I'll ask maybe one person to share theirs and then I'll give you my, my opinion.
Okay. Anybody have uh, what they think would be the solution to this? Or does, does this problem even make sense as a problem? Is it something? Okay. Anybody want to share their solution? Go ahead, Tom. Uh, thanks, Tom. <laughs> How about make the pages divide at a higher level? Okay, so make the pages divide at a higher level. So is that kind of making the pages longer? Yes. Okay, great. Anybody else? Richard? Well, I would say um, rather than fragmenting the info, info um, use a task orientation so that your topics are kind of beginning to end things rather than fragmented pieces of information. So what if... They can still be small. But they, they need to be more task oriented. What, what if you have like uh, creating, editing, and, and printing a widget, right? And you split those out into three separate tasks. Is Why that? Why would you do that? <laughs> I don't know, but I feel like I've seen I, that I, in I a lot you of. You need to choose your tasks at the level of things that ac users <laughs> actually want to do. Now, sometimes they may just want to print something and they, they don't need to do all those other things you said. And I suppose that for that purpose, yeah. you would want okay. a task. But um, more commonly, I think uh, users have higher level tasks. Yeah. And they'd like to know how to do those and have that all in one place. Yeah, OK. Yeah, that's, that's, a, great, that's a great response. And you know, I think uh, other people would, would agree with you that you kind of have a, a goal that, that the user has or a purpose. And you try to you know, put all the information necessary for that user to complete that task or goal, right? Yeah. All right, so my, my uh, hey, Tom, yes, Jillian, question. go for it. Go in the exact opposite direction. Okay. With Dita, everybody wants you to chunk everything to small little individual units. So in Dita, you have to use rel tables and links to connect everything together. So since that's the way the image is going, I don't think it's realistic to say make one more topic. I think it's realistic to say rel tables and links and you know, PDF bookmarks and that kind of thing. So you so let me let me just summarize. So you're saying that with Dita, it encur the model encourages you to create smaller topics, right. and the only way to connect them is through rel tables and other other publishing tricks. Right. <clears throat> yeah, you know, I, I had a big long controversial post on my blog about this, <laughs> and people people who are into Dita um, repeated over and over that you can combine small topics in, in the way you choose to publish. And they talked about different, different things. But uh, this, the reason I, I highlighted this was actually exactly for the reason that you described. Uh, for a lot of help, topic, help systems that use DITA, even easy DITA, for example, um, you can find topics that are one sentence long in there. And it was just mind blowing. I was like, you're kidding me. This whole topic is one sentence or two or three sentences. And, uh, and I started to look at other systems, some um, documentation that I found. I shouldn't name things. I'm just gonna come back to haunt me. I'll have to edit that out. But, but um, people who, I don't know, different companies with really small topics and you land in there and you think, well, how do I understand the bigger picture? And you have to like, try to navigate with the table of contents, but that's usually so big that it's like hard to figure out where to go. Anyway, it's an issue, right? Yeah, we're we're yeah. in the middle of the, of the breakdown process, and we, while you use the word topics for both the data piece of information and an online help topic, they're not the same. Yeah. We're breaking it down to the unifor uniformly sized rocks of information, but then you yeah. can connect, collect them Exactly. In a certain flow for an online help output up to a certain length yeah. for each help topic. But you don't just stop it at the, the size of the data topic and say, here's your online help. Yeah, exactly. Thank, thanks, for, thanks for sharing that. Yeah, definitely the, the, the data model, right, is, is just like a, a model of construction, not necessarily a, a model for design and, and publishing, right? So anyway, uh, my... My, my first gut response is create longer pages, as you've said. If you look at Wikipedia, some of those pages are really long, right? And yet users seem to get the information. Um, a couple reasons why I think longer pages are better. If you go into a supermarket, you can, you can find a lot of different foods. But 
usually when you go into the supermarket, let's say for bread, which is always at the back of the store because they want you to go through all the different aisles as part of like shopping theory, right? And uh, you come out with like five different items instead of the, the bread that you're looking for. Same with a help topic, right? You go in thinking, I want to look, I want to learn how to configure this gizmo. And as you're reading through it, you're like, holy smokes, I didn't know I could make the gizmo fly and I could do this with the gizmo. And so you learn a little bit more just in the same way that you pick up more items in the supermarket. Because a lot of times users who search for stuff, you know, we have a very small um, set of information. We don't always have all the information that's in the help file. So it's a, it's a method for helping people discover what they don't know, what they don't know they don't know. Um, another compelling reason from an authoring point of view, it's a lot easier uh, to maintain the information when it's all in one place, more or less. So those are a couple different reasons. Um, but uh, yeah, the main one is kind of what Richard said. Basically, you, you want to allow the user to complete whatever journey they have, whatever purpose they have, right? And if that purpose is to uh, launch their gizmo and it requires somebody to you know, design the component for it and set up the framework, and there's like several different things, why not put them together? Now, um, this kind of goes with the long topics problem is that once you start adding long topics, right, you don't want to have a page that's super long because that was one of the other problems people found is that pages are long. So I like using collapsible sections, right? The, I don't know if you can see this, but basically you expand them. And these invite all kinds of controversy as well, right? People say, well, people can't scan the page all at once because the information they're looking for is hidden inside of a yeah. hotspot. Or they want to be able to search, and the search page should automatically open the hotspot with the keyword, and a lot of times they don't. But you can get around those, and um, I think the benefit is that basically you have a table of contents up front, and people can expand it. And if you go to Wikipedia, their mobile version, this is how their, their default behavior is. Every section is, is collapsed, and you expand it. Um, all right. Let's go on to next one. Terms are unfamiliar. All right, the help uses terms unfamiliar to the user. For example, gizmo instead of widget. So your challenge is to figure out how you overcome this problem. So take, take a minute there. Maybe you already got it, but take a minute and I'll ha ask a couple people to share. You're already done, look at you. <laughs> this is too easy. <laughs> this is a really hard one. Um, I mean, I, I was at a at a uh, content strategy applied conference last week, and a guy there presented on SEO, and he worked for a builder supply company that specialized in toilets or they made toilets more than anything else and like heated toilet seats was an example so i said what do you do if all the users search for heated toilet seats but the real term is climate controlled toilet seats or something right how do you choose the right term because you're going to have some people who like know what they're looking for and they search for climate controlled toilet seats and you're not ranked and you have like a bunch of other people who've never heard that term they're never going to find it so how do you solve this this predicament who has a, an idea? Well, Yahoo solved that problem a long time ago. Okay, how? With uh, taxonomies and with the uh, dictionaries of synonyms. Oh. Yeah. Well, so Yahoo has a, has a synonym dictionary? Well, that's how they, that's how they yeah. set up their original search engine back before Google. Um, they basically hired uh, librarians or uh, whatever to develop um, okay. taxonomies and so uh, you're talking about their directory their original directory so of the world wide web for, if you want to search for uh, heated mm -hmm. toilet seat and, and the real term is climate control toilet seat they've got that under the covers already mm. they know yeah. that those are yeah. the same and they're, they're waiting for you to specify uh, either one and they'll give you the other uh, so the, on the back end they've put somehow yeah. coded synonyms to be yeah. together right. yeah. Okay. Anybody else have an idea? I mean, that, that obviously applies to help systems, right? Because you can sometimes do that. I think you can do it. Do a little 
research and find out what terms your audience, your users actually use. Yeah. yeah. And, and if you if you do the research, you find out they use term A, but the official term is term B. For maybe it's a medical device, well, maybe whatever. You can, you can try two things. You can <laughs> then you've got some choices to make, and one is to figure out whether your marketing people have their head up the door. <laughs> so I you mean, get to fight words, the battles internally. In words, like, well, you've got, got a good example. I mean, climate control toilet seats. <laughs> I mean, that I, really sounds like a marketing thing. I've got I, one right now. I've got exactly the same thing. I use a seat pack machine. It's got a, it, it's got a climate-controlled humidifier on it. I'm trying to figure out <laughs> how the hell to use that. I just want to, you know, up the humidity. You that's know? always a problem, though, when you can't get around it. Market, marketing is one of the design that determines the names, and you have to... Yeah, but... So well, what do you do? I mean, I worked in a place where the whole, the whole documentation was different from the marketing term. Which yeah. doesn't help. Well, that's why they invented C also. But better than right. that is to get the whole team together early on in yeah. the project and agree on the terminology. <clears throat> yeah. All right. So here, here's my, here's an example. Just recently, we were implementing this tool called Data Sift. Um, it looks through all the tweets and Twitter, and it matches. So, let's say you have a user who's posting about your company, right? And you want to reward them. Well, this, this. Data Sift company will scan all of Twitter and find matches and so forth. So I, I was trying to figure out what are the filtering rules that they use to see whether a word matches. Could not find it for days. I, I, I mean, I spent hours looking for this. Turns out the right term to describe this is tokenization <laughs> and chunking. And uh, other people were telling me, no, you got to figure out the word boundaries and so forth, right? And I kept looking for the wrong terms. So I think we. It's compiler theory. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it wasn't speaking my language, right? But, but it was actually, this help was written for developers, so maybe it does make sense, right? And the other one is CSDL engine, whatever the heck that is supposed to mean, right? It's their fancy, fancy name for whatever algorithm they have. So back to the CSA applied uh, guy. I asked him what you do with your toilet seat th thing, and he said <clears throat> he, does back, he does the synonyms on the back end with his site. And he also said, look, you just got to choose one and try to be consistent, but throw a few places in there that uh, note the interchangeability of the terms. And I think, um, you know, the, the, the winning side is to choose a, a familiar term for me, but at the same time, if you have a, a big button in your application called something like Omnibus or something, which is what I had at one time and nobody understands it, <clears throat> if people Google or if people search for that, they should be able to find some kind of synonym dictionary thesaurus that, that helps educate them, which is part of the other part about <clears throat> browsing and searching, which is kind of fundamental. Browsing and searching work together. When a user searches, they start scanning the results and they learn more. So they, a user searches for get widget for RSS, right? That's, that's the user's terms. And they land on some pages and they see that they see about modules and so forth. So the user says, hmm, maybe it's a module that I'm trying to configure. So the user says, download feed module. And the user lands on, on some pages that say data feed modules. And they're like, oh, maybe this is a data feed module that I'm trying to configure. So they search options to set up data feed modules. And they land on some pages that say setting up the data feed module. And, and from there, they can they can find the real topic, which is configuring data feed modules with RSS. So the browsing and searching should work together in a way that the, the, this, the pages kind of help the user know what the right terms are. Um, anyway, this is, this is uh, what Peter Morville says. He's one of the guys in findability, and he's all about like this interplay between the two. All right, let's move on to the next level. This is a great one, tasks are isolated from each other. The answer is an isolated task, but the user needs a more connected beginning to end workflow. Um, Leah Gurin has given a great example of this. She says, a lot of times on your phone, when you read the guide, if you read the guide, there'll be a topic that explains how to answer a call and another topic that explains how to look up contacts, right? But where's the topic that explains how to look up contacts while you're on a call, which is what everybody needs, right? When somebody asks, 
what's the phone who's what's this person's phone number and you're like shoot and you're pushing buttons trying to figure out how you access the contacts and so forth so this 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 points to this need for these tasks that you do together not as little individual discrete things that you do at like separate individual times so how do you solve this problem in help help is modular right it's based on specific tasks <clears throat> but the user's real workflow is together. As in another analogy, while you're thinking, think of, think of um, <clears throat> football, right? We've got Monday Night Football here. You could, you could drill somebody on how to pass, how to block, how to run, but really the game involves like all of these together at once. <laughs> okay, so yeah, you're starting to break it apart. Okay, does anybody have a, have a solution for level three that they wanna share? level tasks. I mean, you need uh, user stories or use cases or whatever it is. You have to figure out what 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 questions you're going to be answering and answer them. Yeah, that's the thing. Okay. Yeah. Higher level tasks that kind of provide like the overall story of what how you use the different well, parts. You know, you, you just came <coughs> up with a scenario. Okay, well, uh, if that's a common thing that people use, then yes, there should be that should be in there as a thing. <coughs> it, it shouldn't be that you just have isolated little things. Here's how you look up a contact. Here's how you add a contact. Here's how you answer a call. If yeah. if if that's a user story that says, okay, I'm on the phone and I need to look up a contact or I need to take this person and add them to my contacts or whatever it is. Hmm then that should be a task in your health. So, so let's, uh, <clears throat> let's, let me explain like a more complicated situation. If you ever tried to learn Illustrator, uh, <laughs> a lot of times, <laughs> a lot of times you end up using a lot, of a lot of different tools. So if you wanna draw this little flask, you, you have to use the radial gradient topic, the stroke top. Your, well, these could be help topics, right? These are different tools. The radial gradient tool, the outline tool, the shape tool, the pen tool, the, the swatch tool, the reflector tool. All of these have different topics in the help, right? So the user might use half of them, all of them. How do you, so. This is a tutorial. <laughs> tutorial. Is okay, so you create some tutorial topics that are, okay, great. It, I, I agree. This uh, one of my favorite um, illustrator uh, guys, who is a trainer. He's on Lynda.com as Decay McClelland, and he does a lot of these. Like he he explains how to draw a black cat, for example, just because it uses so many different tools. You got the whiskers that you have to curl. You've got the, the eyes with gradients and little reflections. So the idea is that even if you don't really want to draw a cat, you learn how to do the different tools, right? Anybody else have other solutions about the? This uh, problem. The, the yeah. way that you talk about something, you, I've been telling people at my job, using the gradient dialogue is not a task. You know, that's that's yeah. not what anyone wants to do. Yeah. You, you've got to go high enough to say, this is what they want to do. Or yeah. this is what this will allow you to do. This is what this tool is part of in a yeah. larger sense. And in Illustrator, the same tool is part of a lot of different kinds of work that they'll repeat. So you really do it, you have to start at the top from then, never mind what your program does or doesn't do or how it does, what mm. do they do? Yeah, what do they good. Need? Yeah, starting with the users, what they do and trying to speak at that level. Um, here's, a, here's another example of kind of doing that. I call these like narrative workflows and uh, I once documented this meeting management tool that had a lot of different topics and um, one day a product manager said, you know, create a high level story that shows how they all work together. So the topic kind of went like this. Um, Mark is a secretary for the ACME committee. The committee has a meeting coming up next week, so Mark creates a new meeting, and that's a hyperlink to a topic about creating a new meeting, and adds it to the calendar. Mark gathers agenda items and adds each item to the meeting. Mark also estimates the time for each agenda item and adds times for guest visitors. On the day of the meeting, he displays the meeting and agenda view on the projector while opening a second monitor to take notes. During the meeting for each item, Mark routes the item through several workflows. So you can see how, how this sort of topic is, um, could be useful, right? And it's something that gives the user this story about how all these dif different discrete parts fit together and flow. So basically a workflow. Uh, and 
<clears throat> now with this tool, there were some meetings that were super formal and they had like people reviewing minutes and voting. Others, they didn't do any of that. So you might have several different kind of scenarios. And yeah. That, that workflow doesn't match up for someone. In doing it, you've identified smaller <clears throat> tasks that really would fit in yeah. the workflow. You know, that even if they do things in a different order, leave some out, yeah. you're thinking about it from that level, and you are, you're identifying the right subtasks, and then you can say to them, you know, this is what you might do first, and this you have to do before you do that. Right, so because you're going to, yeah. Be universal. People are going to, people are going to pick out the subtasks that relate to them, right? And, uh, you know, I, I, I think most people agree about the usefulness of these, but why is it that we don't often find them in help? You know, usually help dives right into a very specific task. It's like, you know, create a new meeting. It's like, well, when do I do this and how do I? Well, there's nothing in the normal uh, methodology for creating help systems that leads you to this. Yeah, it's, it, is this a task, a concept, or, or a, a reference topic, you know, or, or whatever yeah, model yeah. you've got. So, yeah, maybe it gets kind of left out. It but probably this, can concept, but... This actually points to the biggest problem I have with folks' modern documentation. Yeah. Ever since they abandoned books. And that is that I can find how to do all kinds of these teeny little segments. And usually I've gotten a new piece of software that I can't figure out what it's for. Yeah. And I want what? to know overall what it, you know what's the scope of this desk and why do I care that they you know that it got downloaded to my machine and do I want to use it at all and, and it's almost uh, impossible to find that out yeah so you're you're saying you know you want the like bigger picture of how you use it and what's picture, what, what, what it's what advantage is, what, for me? one reason I think we often kind of forget about that when we're writing help is because we're so immersed in the application that we forget yeah. what it was like to be the, the user on the first day. You know, when I started at my job, I recorded all kinds of notes about, you know, I don't get this and I don't understand this term at all because I knew that after a few months, I wouldn't have that perspective and I would just be like, what? The user doesn't understand what they're supposed to do? They must be a dumb well, user, right? Yeah. <laughs> we're also tied in direct, so directly to the engineers. They say, this is the new feature, write help for it. This is a dialog yeah. box, write help for it. Yeah. And you do that, you get the check in the line in the box and you move on. You have, you're not able or encouraged yeah. to take any different perspective because yeah. they are calling the shots. And, and yeah, if, you're, if you're writing in a push this button, write down what it did. If it blows up, tell the engineer. If it doesn't, move on to the next <laughs> topic. You know, you'll never get to this level of analysis. There's another problem with this sort of topic that I think is, is um, kind of comes back to what authoring model you're using. But notice there are a lot of embedded links in, a, yeah. in this. Now, if you didn't want to have links in there because maybe whatever authoring process you're following doesn't support that linking at a granular level in a very user-friendly way, you've got a real problem. Like you can maybe stick all these links in a, in a table at the bottom, but then it loses like a lot of the understandability. Yeah. It requires something else that I think is kind of implied by what you're saying, and that is that this level of documentation can be written after the rest of everything. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And if you're racing the right topic to ship it out the door, you never get to this. Yeah, so yeah, this is definitely what you write at the end. But anyway, the links pose a major challenge um, to, to some people. That not everybody, just depending upon what tool you're using. So it could be another reason they're skipped. If these are, in fact, important user stories, then they shouldn't be written at the end. Yeah, maybe they should be at the, well, I mean, to link them to the other individual topics, you probably have to do that at the end, but, but you're right. Maybe this should well, be like the beginning. Maybe you have to take a top-down approach where you write this, and then you see I've got all these links, okay, and now I'm going to write those topics. Yeah, yeah, that would be a great idea, like as a framework for, this, for beginning. This fits into what's his, you know, designing what to design yeah, yeah, yeah. concept. You know, something like this scenario should have been in somebody's head before they their product. Right. Yeah, it should be kind of like the user stories, right? This should, this should be, but I've never seen a user story fleshed out like this. Usually they're one sentence, they're, they're thrown in a pile of other JIRAs, and anyway. Yeah. yeah, this product will help you manage all of your paper flow needs <laughs> or something. Okay, last comment before we go to the next one. Yeah. And then if they don't understand the 
So you really need a user champion, somebody who's like uh, seeing the perspective and the story of the user and, and doing this. And, and maybe that's the tech writer. <laughs> All right, let's go on to the next. <laughs> we don't need no user advocates. <laughs> next level. Level four. Help sticks with the obvious only. All right, the, user, the answer isn't in the help because the help only has obvious information. Um, <clears throat> I'll give you a second to yeah. ponder, ponder the uh, solution you've got there. I was, I, I, I can't remember when I, I addressed a lot of these in various posts and people had other posts and discussions and one of the persons, Mark Baker had a really cool post that I liked. He said, he, went, he was arguing for something else. He was arguing for, the, for, for using Google instead of like a, a website. But he, he searched a car site for what's the best kind of car to drive in winter? I, and I think he's in Canada, so it made sense, right? Um, and the site had like no results. And he searched Google and he found tons, right? right? And I was like, well, that's not entirely fair to the site. The site just didn't have that information. No, you, Google could have found something that was on that site, even though you couldn't yeah. find it searching that site. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think a lot of times users, they're, they're looking for information and they don't find it. Here's another example. One day I came home from work and my wife was almost like in tears at the computer. She was throwing stuff around. Yeah. She had ordered $40 worth of books and had them shipped to our old address back in Florida. And she couldn't figure out a way to like, you know, cancel and, and change or reroute. And she was just like so tense. And I said, well, why didn't you look in the help? And she's like, yeah, there's nothing in the help. And there wasn't, there, there wasn't anything that addressed this more advanced scenario. And I think this is like a lot of frustration that people have is it's like, well, I'm not gonna look in the help. It's not gonna have information about that. For example, before this meeting, I looked in Camtasia's help to figure out why when I did the screen recorder in Mac, it was only capturing like a part of the projector screen. There, in, in those oh, oh, that's all right. I'll, I'll fix it later. I'll fix it later. Maybe it's my problem. Anyway, the answer wasn't in there, right? So how do you solve this problem? Anybody have an idea? How do you get past the obvious level? So look at what real users are, are saying in, in knowledge bases and support. Yeah, yeah. So a, a whole awareness level is, is needed. Well, again, it comes back to <clears throat> user stories. I mean, what do you mean by obvious? Yeah. You know, uh, if if something comes up like the the thing you, you talked about uh, with trying to change the shipping address after you uh, ordered something. Um, <clears throat> That is a problem that comes up. And in fact, if you go to the UPS website or whatever, they'll tell you how to change it. Um, <clears throat> but you just have to start from understanding how your product's going to be used and what kinds of things are going to come up. And, and you won't stick with just, you know, quote, unquote, the obvious only. You'll, you'll yeah. stick with, you'll at least cover the things that people are likely to need. <clears throat> That this jumps right into this other larger point I wanted to make <clears throat> is you have you often have two types of users you might have a beginning user and and they're like uh, they, they want some very basic information and you have an advanced user who needs more ex extensive information I have this problem all the time at, at, in my current role we have we have like a marketing audience who is kind of setting up things using an interface and we have a developer audience who uses the API and the SDK in order to do advanced visualizations and the help is on one Drupal platform. It's not like we have a marketer group and a develop. No, they totally intermix because they have their, their information needs blend. <clears throat> so I actually asked somebody uh, at the CSA applied or content strategy applied conference, a lady who gave a great presentation on plain English. I think her name was Deborah Bosley. <clears throat> I said, how do you solve this problem? You want to make it plain, but for whom? You know, the developer wants something more advanced and it goes way over the marketer's head. Um, and she said, she said, you can only, you have to choose your audience. You have to like 
pick your audience because you're, you're never going to satisfy both with the same approach, which, you know, I think that's fine in theory, but what am I supposed to do? Create a separate Drupal site for marketers and take out all the like, um, uh, SDK information so that they're not like confused by that. I didn't, I didn't think, uh, it would quite fit my scenario. Um, but I think you can choose an audience maybe at, at a, at a page level, you know, you maybe have an advanced topic or advanced article and a beginning article, and those can be kind of separated in the same help system. Um, anybody have any other thoughts? Richard? You can use types, type size. For example, you can put the more technical stuff in slightly smaller type <laughs> so that people who are reading through it can recognize stuff huh. that they can skip. Okay. Uh, and, and so and visually, the people who, are, huh. who really want the, the details can read the uh, read the huh. fine print or whatever it is. Most developers I know like have six point font on yeah, their computer. Right. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, the, it'll look big to them. Yeah. Yeah, that's another great one. Yeah. Collapsible text sections. I think that's excellent. Yeah, that was the the other thing I was going to say is it's even more complex than this, and that is that. Your beginning user and your advanced user aren't necessarily different people. Yeah. They, what happens is that over the period of time, you've got at one point he's a beginning, beginning user. Mm. Three weeks later, he's an advanced user. Then he hasn't used the thing for a year. <laughs> now he's an occasional user yeah. who has the concept, but he can't remember how to do a particular thing, but he needs to go back and refresh himself. It but he doesn't need everything explained to him again. And that evolution, that, that's exactly like why, why it's such a problem, right? That's a, a great comment because you know users evolve. And so if I choose my audience, it's not as if that audience is always going to be happy with, with that dumbed down version for them. And you we know? haven't even gotten into putting it on 13 platforms. Yeah. <laughs> well, we used to have this but, problem in, in yeah. command line uh, things in, uh, in the 60s. I mean, when... Well, even even then, it was like, oh, the advanced users don't want to type the whole command, but the beginners need the, to type the whole command because they can't remember what it is. Mm -hmm. We had to develop these things well, where it would, uh, you start to type and it would kind of finish it for you. And Yeah, so that, this is like the, this is a problem I think almost unique to TechCom because it, it, let's say you have a, a an essay in a literary uh, course, right? Sure, there might be advanced William Blake readers and beginning, but by and large, like people read the whole narrative workflow or skip around in in different ways than with technical subjects, right? Where people clearly have different backgrounds. All right, the the other my other solution here is to learn continually, because um, <clears throat> I've noticed that if you want to provide information for like JavaScript developers and you're not, this is my scenario, right? I'm not a JavaScript developer, so I clearly run into like my level of learning or knowledge very quickly. And I'm not sure if, you know, what I've written even helps them. Maybe they look at this and they say, the when method, I knew the when method, uh, you know, when I first learned JavaScript and you're explaining it to me, I'm like, for me, it was kind of, uh, I had to look it up. I had to like figure it out. It took me a while. So, <laughs> um, I think, uh, the, but, but in order to kind of be aware of what's obvious, what's not, like, you know, if you, if you write down, hey, when you have a reference to your JavaScript, you have to put it between script tags. I think people who are, who are JavaScript developers don't need that, you know? So learning continually, I like Safari books online. If you've ever seen this site, it is amazing. Um, it costs 43 bucks a month, but you have access to anything. Uh, there's Anything probably yes right? sorry yeah <laughs> but you, you have yes really yes. wait only from the library you get access oh i need to i need to figure this out because i've been paying 43 dollars a month since i moved here <laughs> No, this is my strategy. I'm like, look, I want to move into developer documentation. I need to ramp up. And I try to, I try to my technique is that I, I have this, uh, have you heard of the Pomodoro method? It's uh, Italian for tomato. Tomatoes. Yeah, but basically this guy had a tomato timer, or some kind of timer, and he would uh, set it for 25 minutes and he would like study for 25 minutes and he would take a break. And then, uh, then he'd come back 
whoa. Anyway, he'd come back and, <laughs> and he'd do another 25 minute, minute attack. And I think this works well. Like on my way to work, I'll spend 25 minutes really trying to learn some technical subject that's relevant. And, and, and after 25 minutes, my brain is pretty much done, right? And I need a break. So chunk it, chunking it up, using sites like this can, can help move into that. Why was this the Pomodoro method? Because you had a, have you ever seen these timers that you twist and then it's like, and it looks like it Yeah. It's a kitchen timer. Yeah, kitchen timer, thanks. Anyway, that's why he called it. But there's a whole like methodology developed behind it. But it's basically chunking, chunking your study study um, sessions into 25 minute segments. So go alternating with cooking your spaghetti sauce, okay? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. Maybe you use the beatball timer, yeah. 25 minutes important, what is that? Well, um, I don't know. Maybe he, he, he realized that 25 minutes was maximum retainal, or retainer period in terms of memory. I have no sure, idea, yeah. really. But um, I, mean, well, I think people who try to learn technical subjects need it chunked into small iterations rather than like one massive inflow of information. So that's the, the idea. Yes. I think another valuable thing for us is if we're learning something, take notes of the process we're following because yeah. that's what users will do. Yeah. And you know, what, what are our questions at this point? What subject do we have in trouble with? That's the, 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 the first data you can have yeah. about so you, what's going to be a, an FAQ, what's going to be a problem for the help because the help is there to answer particular questions. Definitely. So whenever you have one, I, I remember I was reading stuff about JavaScript, and it, and it said the first thing you have to do is learn how to, how to fail and fail quickly, right? So if your, applic if your code is going to fail, you don't want it to fail after it's run through all kinds of other stuff. And I was like, holy crap, I didn't mention this in the documentation at all. So I, I tried to address that. You okay. write that topic, how to fail quickly. <laughs> that's, that's not JavaScript. That's anything. I know, I know. Yes. Okay, next level. We've got two more levels here. And uh, I'm kind of running out of time, so we'll see how uh, we go. Poor, okay, the user searches for an answer, but the help's poor mm -hmm. SEO prevents the answer from surfacing. All right, so 50% of people basically blame their own help system for poor SEO as the problem behind why users can't find their answer. Anybody have a solution for this one? This is, this is probably the most controversial one, and I didn't even want to put this in because it doesn't seem to focus as much on content, but, but it was a, a, a salient answer. What? Well, the optimization engine can't find it. For example, I don't know if this is still true, but it, like in Flare, it used to be that if you search for something, you'd get hundreds of results. I think they changed that now. But uh, a lot of other help systems, you search, and there's just a poor search experience. Um, it's not Google-like, right? Everybody likes Google because they find stuff in it. And then they go to the help system, and they don't. This is part of the reason why. Uh, let's say that you have a help system that uses iframes. Well, search engines and iframes don't mix well. Because the iframe is basically a little snippet of code that says, look, the real content is somewhere else. I'm going to pull this in dynamically. And, and if you look at the source view of your, of your help and you don't actually see the content, well, Google probably doesn't see it either. So that could be a problem. Um, Richard, you had your hand up like you were going to say something. Well, I was just going to say there's only one solution to this problem, and that <laughs> is uh, to study search engine optimization techniques, which is a broad field of study, and it's not, uh, it's not one simple thing. There are, dozens and dozens of techniques uh, that fall under the uh, uh, label of search engine optimization and, and really it's important to learn them if you're going to be doing web development. So, so here's a question though, okay, right, you're totally right, you, there's a lot, I mean there's whole conferences on this, right? There's a whole, I mean this is a whole industry unto itself, search engine optimization. But who has time for this as a technical writer, right? You're, you're busy publishing and you barely meet the release date and now you have to somehow recast all your sentences so that you optimize for a keyword that you think maybe users are looking for. So here's, here's my recommendation. Publish on a web platform that already has a lot of this optimized. For example, uh, many of the popular platforms, WordPress, Drupal, Joomla, other 
web-like ecosystems already are optimally kind of surfacing things in a decent way. I, I once um, uh, <clears throat> had my help on a certain help system. I don't want to bash help systems because some people actually sponsor my site and I like other tools. <laughs> but I had my help on one help system that kind of had its own self-contained output. And, and I put it on Google. I was actually replacing a MediaWiki site, right? So I had my content on, media, content on MediaWiki, replaced it with another hat tool, help authoring tool. And I, I tried to update Google. I even put backlinks from my blog to the new pages. I used Google Site Master tools to make sure Google had the pages so they could index them. I used a sitemap on the tool itself. I tried to do everything I could. It took like six to seven months before it even showed up um, on the first page. For the first while, it was on like page four. And this old MediaWiki site where I had completely gutted the content still ranked in the top like few results. Um, so that depends a lot on who's pointing to it. And if they're not pointing to your yeah. new site, if, if respected oh. people are not pointing to your new site, but are pointing to the old site, the old site's going to rank. Yeah, yeah they, have, they, they have put pointing to it. Yeah. Well, Okay, here's, the, here's one of the problems with hats, though, is they make it so easy to change all your URLs in one go. Like, you update the page, you want to change the URL, bam, you know, it's done. Well, Google hates it when you change the page URL because it has to re-index it and re-rank it. So every time, if, if a help authoring tool makes it really easy to change those page URLs, it's bad news for SEO. The, the harder it is, the better. The more difficult it is. Tom, you had your hand up a while ago. Did you want to make a comment? Okay. Uh, no, thanks. All right. The other, my other tip is to just keep aware of Google. Um, try to kind of look at how your site and content look from a perspective of a Google indexer. You can implement something called Google Site Search, uh, where you basically take Google and you limit it to your own domain, and then you can see what, what appears from searches there. And just that kind of awareness is, is good. Um, so just kind of keep aware. And, and you know, I... I uh, we, we talked earlier, no, sorry, that's coming up. But we talked earlier about um, section headings. No, we didn't talk about that. I'm going to talk about that soon. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll remember that, all right? But subheadings are a great SEO technique that I think help with repeating a, a keyword um, really seamlessly. Okay, level six. The help doesn't provide concrete examples that make concepts understandable. All right, so how are, this, this seems like an obvious solution, but um, how would you address this? Because clearly a lot of help lacks examples and not being injected in there. So what are you going to do to, so to problem? It ties in with the workflow. If you have that, you can then follow the workflow through with a representative scenario that puts these actual steps in, in the process. Yeah, so this totally ties in with the workflow. Standard yeah. Data set. But let me give an example of that. So this is a, an add new post screen in WordPress. And over here you have this feature called um, publish immediately or at this future date, which is referred to as time stamping. So let's say you write a post, uh, but you don't want it to publish until like Wednesday, right? You can set it all up so that it's got Wednesday on the publish date and hit publish. Now, why would you want to do this? Um, I, think if you, <laughs> I think if you were to add an example here, Something in the documentation that said, look, uh, let's say that you live in China and your readers are in uh, the U.S. And so you want to set your post to publish at the optimal reading time, which is like 11 a.m. rather than 2 a.m., right? Um, that kind of example does something that's not usually found in the tasks. It adds a strategic decision support type of information. It helps people figure out how they're going to use this tool in a real business scenario. So that's why I think examples are so cool, is because they bring things to life. You say, oh, this is how I could use this uh, in this scenario. It forces you to be uh, business aware of, 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 the, of an actual context. I th think there's one, one thing <clears throat> with examples. And yeah. that is, a lot of people try to get examples, say, by taking Right. QA code and adapting it or asking the developers to give them an example or whatever. And 
th th those are not good sources of examples. The best sources of examples are from users. Mm -hmm. uh, so if, you, yeah. if you're talking about some product and you want examples, you go to the users who are usually happy to contribute examples and who contribute examples that are much more real than anything your developers will come up with or anything that your QA department will come up with because those are mm -hmm. for a different purpose. Exactly, yeah, yeah. And so where do you, where's the best place to get these user examples? You know, you, users. Well, well, I mean, that involves, <laughs> let's say that you, you, you don't have direct contact with them for whatever reason, you know. How do you mine uh, some kind of area where you actually get well, their the, scenarios? The obvious way is, uh, is to have a, uh, have a site that, uh, where you and users collaborate, hmm. where they contribute stuff, um, even if you've never met them or talked to them, uh, if they're contributing stuff on your site. IBM does this. Hmm. Uh, forums? Yeah. Okay. Developer forums. I, the only reason I'm asking is because we have we have forums and we have like very low participation on them and and I, I don't really interact with users like I, I guess I should. It's always been one of those like uh, got to go out of your comfort zone, you know, out of your way to go find and talk to a user, and that's like the domain of the product managers, right? So. Uh, it's hard to find, but it's essential to get real examples. Otherwise, they're just corny kind of yeah. examples. Like, so it's one, it, I, one way, one idea is that if you have to set up a site in which the users basically aren't thinking of you, they're thinking of sharing with each other. Yeah. So, like, you could. And then you basically eavesdrop on their conversation, steal the content of their minds, and don't pay them for it. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> that model, yeah. but 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 I think that uh, uh, I was being a little snarky there. But but my point was is that if some guy's done, done something really clever, he wants to tell another user right about the clever thing he did. Yeah, I think you know, some and, and do it do it that way more than sitting there and going, boy, I figured out how to use their product. I think I'll tell them that I figured out how to use their product. You know, it sounds to me like a recipe for low participation. But it, it's more than that, too. They, if you have a site like that, it's not that they just want to tell what they did. They also want to come up there with questions because they've got problems and somebody that, else knows the answer. Yeah. That's, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, both ways. Yeah, so any way you can, can incentivize the engagement there with, with people sharing is, is totally, you know, a great strategy. And they, they um, won't keep coming back if they come a few times and they don't get anything out of it. Right. People, people actually love to be asked information like that. You know, they feel listened to. Um, I used to do that a lot in my previous job. I was totally into these forums, and people, wow, they were so, uh, they were so willing to share. Let me, let me throw one more um, big use case for examples, and that's code examples, right? This is a, a post from Sarah Maddox where she talked about how they were like revamping uh, Google Maps API documentation, and it, one of the things they were doing was putting a lot more examples. And this is so easy to say and yet so difficult to do. I, I, we have this uh, JavaScript SDK that I was documenting. And like, there are so many different examples that um, would be helpful to people. Um, we, we launched this API, right? And the developer said, oh, people will get it. They'll know how to use these different methods together. They and really, <laughs> I know they always <laughs> say that. But they really believed it. And they were like, so and I was, I was totally new. But little by little, we started to get feedback users have said, hey, we need examples, real examples, and they're hard to do. A, because coming up with code examples, um, there's a lot that I don't really tend to consider, like, hey, is this querying a huge database and process, spending a lot of processing time that's then dragging down our performance? Oh, uh, didn't even think about that. Or, um, you know, am I, do I have one too many line of, lines of code here? And I'm like breaking the developer's um, code of you know efficiency so anyway developing these code samples with API documentation is is huge I mean it's like probably the most important part of API sort of efforts okay but you don't do it yourself you get it from users uh, well the users aren't in my scenario it's a new thing we launched so we don't really have users doing it yet you, you probably have baby users you have somebody out there who's leading the path you're right you're right that's a great example I should 
I should, uh, I do know a user who used it innovatively. And, and that is our hope, actually, is that we had, that we would have like all these users sharing different code examples. It's just taken a while to get off the ground. But what you're describing, too, is there's, there's two things. There's the code examples to explain mm -hmm. how to use things, and then there are um, code points, you know, where you can just take a piece of code. And yeah. It. You're, you're kind of talking about the second. But I think sometimes there, you know, if you really want to explain something, how they work together, you, you can't worry about how, whether it's sufficient code on the back end, because then that can, then it's not as illustrated as. Well, you know, what? this has been a major conundrum for me, so maybe you can solve this. All right, so <clears throat> you're totally right, right? There's a difference between just ready-made code samples. Here, grab this piece of code, stick it in there, and you've got a reward showcase, right? Versus Here's an example of how you could render like earned rewards in color and unearned rewards in black and white. So you use like illustrator principle. <clears throat> but where do you put all the explanation if you want to do that the latter type, the non-cookbook type? You want to actually explain I'm using this method because of this reason. And yeah, traditionally people put them in little code comments. I don't see any there, but a couple slashes and they give a really cryptic brief, you know, message doing such and such. That, that, that doesn't really explain to a, a more lower level user. So how do you, how do you where do you put all that? My, my method is, currently I, what I do is I put the code sample up at the top of the article in the full block and it's got like brief comments. And below it, I kind of take out the excerpts uh, every five lines or so and explain in detail what's going on. But it seems clunky. That's how to do it. <clears throat> okay. What, what I really want to do is like somehow have the code example, like the comments in the code example, like expand out or something. No, no, no. No? They, no. Programmers hate having really? a lot of comments in their code because it takes up screen You're right. real yeah. You know, they're already at six point because they want to put a lot of stuff on their screen, right? Yeah. Okay. Jillian. Yeah. Ideally in there. See? And yeah. Illustrator is actually a really hard example because that's designed for people to be creative and you don't know how they're going to be creative. So mm. trying to tell them, you know, to expect you're going to make a cat or whatever, that, that's like impossible. Like with my <laughs> company, for example, we know what our end users are going to do. We know what their goal is. We know what cats they have to do. The reason that there are, you know, different options they can pick, but it's not as elaborate as Illustrator. So uh, it's just great. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for offering that. That's totally a, a great comment. So you're basically, just to summarize, you're saying kind of know the limits and, and put the more extensive sort of uh, training into a course, a training course, and, and take it there rather than... Well, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a... What Gillian's talking about is a political situation yeah. where, where you have a, a, a two different... Uh, business groups <coughs> in, inside the company in, in conflict. Yeah. Whereas, you know, they, the training people have their their objectives uh, and, and they have a profit loss uh, thing that they have to satisfy. And then you have the developers and, uh, and the, mm. uh, I, I don't know, whoever the tech writers report to. And they have, they have their objectives which are in conflict with the uh, training department's well, objective you, you, in, in some ways. You'd hope that like the documentation people wouldn't be forced to kind of sell the user short in term in hopes that you like the user that. would pay you for the training that, that, that they need. The power yeah. Anything. All right, let's go on to the last level. Long text buries the answer. Okay, so 52% of the people said the answer is buried on a long page, but the user spends just two minutes on the page max scanning it really quickly. Well, really so. easy solution to that. Yeah, get better users. I, I want to hear from somebody. I, I I want to hear from somebody who hasn't commented yet. Somebody who hasn't made a comment. This is your chance. You're kind of pulling out the shy people. Just kidding. I shouldn't say shy. People who haven't felt like they wanted to share. Anybody? 
Okay. All right, Richard, tell me what your solution is. It's pretty obvious. Edit. Uh, it, um, edit? Edit. You know, well, you don't do write works. long pages full of <laughs> well, crap where what, what you're looking for is, you know, buried in something else. <laughs> well, well, let's say this is, has been edited. It's been whittled down to the most concise way, but it's... it's you, this comes back to our very first screen where we said long pages. It's put all the information the user needs. Well, you have to. Well, sorry. Just chunk it. Yeah. yeah. You can have Headings. There we go. You can have you can have long pages without burying stuff. Yeah. If the information is well chunked and well well organized and well signaled with headings and whatever. Yeah. You know, and and the way it's ordered. Def it doesn't have to. I mean, you can bury information in a three-sentence paragraph if you're really very incompetent. You know, or, you, you know, or you can make information easy to find in a long page. The, this is, uh, I totally agree with you on the headings one. I think headings are one of the most useful like techniques because it allows you to just bolt on more information easily without having to try to like integrate it seamlessly in there. Um, it is. It offers scannability. If you look in the supermarkets, right, you have headings on each aisle. With without them, it would be a lot harder to find things. I'm not saying they totally solve the findability issue. Um, the other one that I didn't hear from. I thought I heard somebody say picture. That was you. Okay. Figures. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. Caps. Yeah. That's. Do, replace this, the if nothing more than just giving visual balance, uh, it totally draws the eye whenever you have a picture. Like if you go back to the pretty, the duck, baby, I mean, that's. Yeah. That kind of summarizes what it's a symbol of. Totally. Yeah, I mean, this, this user is actually, this is from a screenshot from UX movement or that's an image. Good. And they, they recommended putting images next to headings, which is great, you know, if you can do that. But the, this is a visual I was making. <laughs> At, at my work to, to explain, um, actually the whole data sift process that I was explaining earlier, where you have like, uh, anyway, it, the diagram had real words and it kind of made sense, but it's not hard to make simple shapes like this. Yeah. I think a lot of times when people um, think about visuals, they get intimidated, but this is a, this is a person, right? It's a semicircle with an oval on top. Tom, um, let me ask you, yeah. I mean, let me ask you, picture is worth a thousand words, is that really true? Is that me? Um, depends on the picture and, uh, and the words. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Well, you know, the, the, the greatest invention, so to speak, in communication has been to combine words and pictures together. But I don't think many technical writers really take that to heart. We live and breathe in words and we forget about pictures, partly because we've been trained in a society that's very word heavy. When did you, how many classes of English did you take that were like, write this essay, write this essay? Where were the, like, the art classes that said, um, you know, rather than draw a duck or something, <laughs> but but where was the where was the visual kind of class that infused the academic with the visual, rather than just treating art as its own thing? You can find classes in both, but you don't. But they are taught in like they were totally different universes. In other words, there's very few art classes that you'll take that are art for the purpose. Of, they're all for self-expression, but they're not for the purpose of communication. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the fault, you know, it's a different kind of thing. It's and it's it's how to yeah. how to communicate visually is is not a subject that you see. Totally. Richard, yeah. So I, I was listening to radio last night and uh, Moira Gunn was interviewing Dan Rome. I don't know if Oh yeah, back of the napkin guy. Back yeah, and he in fact he has a thing the one about, guy? Uh, I forget what it was, the back of the napkin or something. Oh, he okay. said a lot about uh, visual communication. Uh, and he's got a thing called the Napkin Academy that's, that's supposed to be kind of like the Khan Academy where he goes through a lot of, a lot of stuff online. But he, he's got a new book out. I think it's called something along the lines of Blah, Blah, Blah. Yeah. Where he, he basically he makes just exactly the point you're making. He says that every, everything should be a combination. And if you understand something in words, try to put it in pictures. And if you understand something in pictures, try to put it in words so that you get both of totally. these ways and then you achieve a higher level of understanding. Uh, you know, I've, I've attended uh, lectures by him and I've read like the blah, blah, blah. I've read the back of the napkin. And they, they all say, other people who have presented at like tech com conferences all say this, this same thing. I mean, in addition to the point you make, they say that, that it's, 
the execution of, of the art isn't really the difficult part. The difficult part is coming up with a way to, to illustrate an idea, like to figure yeah, out, yeah. you know, how are we going to present this? And if you can scratch it out as badly as it's drawn, you know, it's, it's the ideation of how I'm going to show this. That's really hard. Yeah. Um, you know, we have all kinds of challenges like this, and, and it's, it, they're fun puzzles to solve. You had your hand up. Getting back to uh, the idea of information being buried, it reminds me of journalism and burying the lead. Mm -hmm. Just because you're covering a lot of material doesn't mean you have to do it in chronological order or something like that. You put the important stuff at the top. Yeah. If, if they're writing about this football game, they don't go in the first quarter this happened, second yeah. quarter this happened. They say they won the game on a field goal in the last minute. That's right. At the yeah, top. that's a good good point. So yeah, that organization of it is as well. All right, so. That's the end of the levels. So hopefully you are able to um, put some stuff at each level and, and stay engaged that way. And uh, so here, here's kind of a seven point summary. Um, are my help topics complete unto themselves? Am I using terms familiar to the user? Do I include workflows and processes? Do I go beyond the obvious? Is my search surfacing the right results? Do I use enough examples to make it clear? Do I allow for easy page scanning? So all these things are, are great to kind of analyze and assess our content. And uh, that is the end. Now, oh, with the game, so you'll notice there's two other steps. If these, are, these are optional. The whole thing's optional, of course. <laughs> but if you want, you can take a picture like with your smartphone, or you can even scan it, but, and post it on Twitter with the hashtags techcom and game. And, uh, and see how many retweets you get. It might be fun, right? So, and I invite also people who are listening to this, you know, recording later to do the same. All right, thanks guys, I appreciate it. And uh, my website is I'dRatherBeWriting.com. If you ever want to uh, check it out, if you want to just like you're bored at work, you want something entertaining. I'm working on a great, as a preview, I'm working on a great post for Halloween called the Telltale Project. You know, patterned after Poe's insanity with the t anyway. Okay. <laughs> the tail, tail, <laughs> 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 All right, thanks. All right, well, thank you.